It's been a pleasure to serve as the chair of the board of this Arboretum and to come to know you all. And it's an even greater pleasure to stand up today and thank you. And now to move on to the wonderful program we're going to hear today about our cold hardy fruit and nuts. I'm asking Mark Wolf, our executive director, to introduce our friends who are back for this presentation. Thank you, Abby. Thank you very much. Um, so as Abby said, we're welcoming uh, Scott and Allison back. Their arboretum is near us in Stone Ridge, and we consider them um, generous neighbors and really good friends. Generous because we have two pawpaws that they gave us a while ago, and they're going to talk about the pawpaw tree that are still alive and well. They gave us a really cool plant called a devil's walking stick that is not alive anymore. <laughs> I think the voles ate it. And they, um, oh great, great. And they gave us uh, two Dunstan chestnuts. As you all, many of you know, the chestnuts are being, were, were decimated 100 years ago and there are still some here and there in the wild. And there's a Dunstan chestnut that is a cross between Chinese and American and, and that was actually a housewarming gift for us, I think, when we, when we opened the building. Um, so uh, we, again, we appreciate you coming back and we're really excited to, to hear about the book. So I'm going to read their, their little bio. Allison, it's Levy, right? Or Levy. Allison Levy and Scott Serrano are both exhibiting visual artists who co-founded Hortus Arboretum and Botanical Gardens in New York's Hudson Valley. Over two decades ago, they began gardening as a source of inspiration and for raw materials for their art. Over time, their interest in growing a wider selection of plants expanded until the garden encompassed 11 acres and became their primary passion. <laughs> Along the way, they began planting a vast diversity of plants, both edible and ornamental, this grew into an extensive collection of cold hardy cactus, magnolia trees, viburnums, and grafted fruit trees with a focus on rare, underutilized, and endangered plants. The Arboretum, their Arboretum, is now a nonprofit organization and a level two Arboretum with a total of 21 acres. And I encourage you to visit, I mean, it's, it's a really great, wonderful place. Uh, they have, you have open days, right? Uh, weekends. Okay, and um, there are copies of their book, um, which I have read cover to cover. It's really uh, wonderful, very good hands-on advice, especially for growing in our cold hardy region. And we're also, we just did a second printing of um, 21 Trees, uh, the book about the building of this building and the trees that hold it up. And so that will be for sale also after the talk. Um, so I welcome Allison and Scott. Can we take off our masks? I think we should take our masks off yeah, because so. I'll understand you, but they might not understand <laughs> you. So I still wouldn't understand him with a mask. Well, hello, everybody. Hi. Thank you hello. so much for being here. And thank you, Mountaintop Arboretum, for inviting us back to talk. Um, we love to talk, so I'll just move straight into talking. Well, we love gardening and plants, and um, let's see, so bear with me. Let's see. Ah, thank you. There we go. All right, so here we go. As Mark had mentioned, Scott and I run an arboretum in Stone Ridge, New York, in Ulster County. And um, we look up to Mountaintop Arboretum for several reasons, but we consider it like our older brother. And um, we're a mom and pop startup. We've been doing this for over 20 years. We do now have 21 acres of <coughs> gardens, about eight of it are cultivated. We bought the swamp in the back of our property, <laughs> so it couldn't be developed. <laughs> Tonight we're talking about native edibles, but we grow all sorts of plants, including ornamental trees, native plants we love, but we also love non-natives, 
And we're really interested in experimenting with the hardiness range and what can be grown in our environment. As we know, with um, climate change, things are really affecting the ways we grow plants and how we think about things. And so that's one of the things that we're interested in doing here. As Mark mentioned, we do have open days. Uh, we partner with the Garden Conservancy for that kind of thing and digging deeper. But we started opening our gardens from Mother's Day to Halloween on Saturdays and Sundays. And if you visit our website, which I'll have up at the end slide, which is hortusgardens.org, you can reserve to come. And um, just showing you some eye candy. We really believe that Ibush blueberry. every time of the year while we're open is a wonderful time to come visit. And we do classes, we do tours, we do talks on site. We work with garden clubs and other uh, community groups who are interested in just knowing about plant life in general. And we're going to start off with um, American chestnut, and Scott uh, will speak about that. Okay, ca Castanea dentata cross Melissima Dunstan. Uh, when American chestnuts were wiped out by the blight, uh, Howard Dunstan, who was a, a fruit grower in Tennessee, a tree grower in Tennessee, was contacted by a man in Ohio who had one chestnut survive the blight that had not that had killed all of his other trees, and he sent scions to Howard Dunstan for grafting. Howard Dunstan then called the US Department of Agriculture and asked for improved um, nut varieties from China to be crossed with it. And the reason he did that is because Chinese chestnut is not affected by the blight. It's evolved at the same time. Took those, crossed them, then grew those for four or five years, then took the pollen and crossed back once again. So it's 3 quarters American, a little tiny bit Chinese. Um, and we've had about four or five years of, of American chestnuts from them. They're delicious, wonderful. The trees are beautiful. There's the male flowers coming out, and the female flowers are tiny little flowers on the, the ends, which eventually become the fruit. Um, trees kind of are going to seem to be an intermediate between a Chinese chestnut and American chestnut. Great dragonfly, Darner. <laughs> Maybe 30 feet. Um, seems to be about zone five. You need two trees for pollination. Uh, good drainage would be important. I think when these are waterlogged, they tend to get diseases, which is why chestnuts, I think, in Appalachian forests are generally found in mountainsides. Um, my son was trying, my son for the summer is trying to hike every hiking trail in our area. And he said he went through a section of mountainside in our area where there were dead test chestnut trees that re-sprouted suckers and shoots and it was along a mountainside and he said he counted hundreds along one mountainside mm -hmm. and that's where they would tend to be. They would be on sloped areas where they like drainage. Other than that, ours have grown successfully for about 10 years and never had the blight. It's been really great. You need two trees for cross-pollination and one of the virtues of a chestnut tree is we've seen four-foot chestnut trees actually produce nuts as opposed to some trees where it's 30 years, 20 years. So chestnut trees actually go into fruit production at a fairly young, uh, nut production at a fairly young age. Right now at, at, at the Arboretum, our trees have, uh, one of the trees is full of nuts. These are the outer casings. And I would say what, in the next several weeks, they should be able to crack open yeah. And that's oh, what yeah. they look like. And if you wait for them to crack open and fall out of the trees, you're not going to see the nuts. The squirrels are going to take care of them for you. So we found when they crack, first crack open, if you take hooks and pop them off the trees and put them in a box in your living room, they'll slowly crack open and open over a period of weeks, and you can eat them and without the critters taking all of them. Um, but they're wonderful. Um, excellent quality nuts. And that, low maintenance, I mean, that's part of one of the things no that diseases. we've been looking for. Yep. Yeah, our book, one of the themes is no spraying. There's nothing that has to be sprayed in our book, um, which is why there aren't apples and peaches in our book, because they're a nightmare. So these are all things that don't have to be sprayed. <laughs> Another couple of little eye candy. And that's when they popped open. 
And this is American hazelnut, Coriolis americana, another great native tree, shrub, <laughs> shrub tree. I guess it depends on where it's sited and its aspect. Um, in our gardens, I'd say it's about 15 to 18 feet yeah. um, large. Ours is sited in a part shade uh, environment where it's slightly moist, um, but they're fairly adaptable trees, adaptable really to the heavy clay, which is something that we have a lot in our area. As I said, they're part shade in our arboretum, but they can also take full sun. Sometimes you'll see them out in the wild along stream or edge wet areas that were alluvial. Um, you will need to have more than one in order to have fruit production, but if that's not something you want and you just want to have a beautiful native shrub, you can see this is almost, a, I call this a four season plant because these male flowers, the catkins, actually start to present themselves in late fall as the leaves become deciduous and they will continue to grow. You could see here, this is early winter. And they're beautiful because in early spring, when nothing much is going on, you have these beautiful flowers that hang and they move in the breeze, which is one of the ways that they actually pollinate one another. This is a nice stand of them. And here I'm showing you the flower up on the top, tiny, teeny female flower. So these are really dependent on wind for pollination. Because there's no pollinators in early. <laughs> Everything's asleep. Yeah. Again, I'm showing you the tiny, teeny little flower. These can be cross-pollinated with European hazelnuts, like bread varieties for large production, um, or themselves. Um, you need two, two for, 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 for pollination. Yeah. Hazelnuts also go by the name of filbert. They also go by cobnut. Um, it's based on the involucre, how long or short it is covering the nut. Uh, native to Massachusetts and a lot of the Northeast is um, Coriolis cornuta, which is the beaked hazelnut, where the outer husk basically covers the whole nut. Taste is pretty much the same um, to, to our taste. I, someone could argue that, I'm sure. <laughs> um, beautiful, just a very stunning ornamental plant. So you've seen the male flower, female flower, eh but the fruiting nut is gorgeous. And European hazelnuts are just larger. Yeah. And then the kind that are go into the production of making Nutella, are like mm -hmm. American are like this, European are like this, and then the double-sized varieties which we have are about like this. And those are the kind for making Nutella and Belgian chocolate and stuff. They're just larger, but the flavors is the all same. similar yeah. quality. It's the amount of work that you want to do to get to the nut. Great wildlife plant, though. Um, in our gardens, I have to put bags over the nuts because they're tricky. If you harvest the nuts too early, they a lot of times will not fully ripen. And this last month of when we've been in a drought, yeah. the nuts haven't really had the ability to form inside the invulcrum. So what looks like it might be formed might not really be. And we don't give extra irrigation to our hazelnut area. So if you did, you probably would be able to have the nut meat happening, which is about now, maybe another two weeks. They haven't fallen off the shrub yet into the bags. We're bagging them because the chipmunks and squirrels don't really care if the nut is ripe like we do. They don't have that fine taste. So. Um, here I'm going to show a couple different images of um, some of the hazels that we've found. Here this was along um, like a rail trail yeah. where you could see the involucre is very short compared to the ones that we showed you earlier that are um, at the Arboretum. So these were in the wild. Uh, one of the queens, uh, American uh, persimmon, Diasporus virginiana, a, an incredible fruit tree. This has more of a wild character than Asian persimmons, which have been bred by Chinese emperors to be this large. American ones are bred by Native American tribes until the 19th century, and then people started picking them. White people, colonial people, saying, oh, you should plant that one for larger fruit, and they started being selected. So American ones were still kind of small and wild. Uh, American ones are not as sweet as Asian ones, but they make up for it by having a complex flavor. 
I kind of think it has a mild butterscotch molasses flavor to me. Um, and you never want to eat underripe persimmons. You want to eat them dead ripe. And the best or way to do that. Or you'll never eat a persimmon again if you, you put you too much. Like oh, our trees yeah. drop three or four at a time on the ground, and I have to race our dogs out <laughs> to make sure they don't grab them. And when they're dead ripe, they have a mild butterscotch molasses flavor. Um, absolutely delicious and wonderful. I think the best thing to do is to get a, a reliably self-fertile, because otherwise they're they're um, they're separate male and female plants. Persimmons are extremely complicated. Originally, they were bisexual trees. And then over time, through evolution, they became separate male and female. But in the upper Midwest, there remains a stand of them that still have the self-fertile capacity. And those are the ones that were selected. The, um, early golden is a 19th century variety. I would highly recommend um, our favorite is a John Rick, which produces two inch large, clean, beautiful Halloween orange fruit. Zucchus is another pop popular one that's a tiny, little, small butterscotch flavored one that's really excellent. I say if you have a small yard and you do not have a lot of room, Zucchus is good. If you want a big, large, stately tree that drops lots of persimmons, John Rick is wonderful. Proc and Molar are also reputation. Uh, great adaptable no spray crop in 18 years. Ours has never had a problem. There's a Scylla, a little kind of a leaf hopper that chews on our leaves and makes them look ugly and a little bit of mold on the leaf, but that's never affected crops. And, and in, animals will occasionally harvest ours, but it's never stripped. Again, in 18 years, um, even with the drought, ours look a little really? bedraggled and beaten up, but there's still oh, fruit on them. And I'm lingering on this shot because I just want you to notice. So this is one that is in late fall. The leaves have all fallen. Certain cultivars of persimmon, the fruit will actually persist on the branches, which is a really nice aspect. I know on our John Rick, the fruit tends to fall yeah. on that particular. But this, I believe, is a zucchus yeah, that Scott had mentioned. And if you can take note, the, the way you know a persimmon's dead right, besides it being smushed, on the ground <laughs> is that it gets this kind of shiny appearance, translucent. translucent, and sometimes it'll also get little markings, like you see the dark spots here. And I've seen persimmons at the very, very top of some of our trees because we can't get to them, and they'll persist through January. So that's really a cool thing, especially for people who are really interested in wildlife because this is a wonderful treat for my, you know, the birds that are hanging out. And I think Native nature. American tribes pounded these flat and made breads out of them and preserved them as a traveling food. A traditional colonial thing is persimmon bread that's like a kind of a carrot cake made with crushed up persimmon and molasses that brings out that. I like, I've made a persimmon um, almost like a maple syrup by crushing up persimmons and cooking it down with honey. That's really excellent. It kind of maintains the, the character of it. And really, for most people, I'd say one tree is plenty. A but good, if good you productive. end up having a lot, you can freeze the fruit, and then you can make breads or puddings. And again, you could see how some of the fruit has started to split. That's how you know it's and I, ripe. And I would say small trees like Zucchus are going to be 20. John Rick mm -hmm. looks like it's going to be more 30, 30 40 feet. Um, I would say if you can avoid it, avoid um, meter. Meter is the one that seems to be easy to graft, so everybody sells it. Yeah. But that, ret that ret retains astringency. There's a slight sour thing, as where the zucchus is like eating more like molasses and sugary. It's, it's much better. And Delicious. the John Rick, much better. Delicious. And if you've never had an American persimmon and you want to, you come to the Arboretum. Because one of the things that we have learned, it's partially why we've written the book, is that if you don't taste something, you might not get inspired to plant it. So one of the things that we try in time um, when we do tours there, but now we're open on the weekends as well, if you come and they're ripe, we will say, would you like to try one? And that way it gets you motivated to, yeah, sure, and maybe there's something you want to plant. And that's just showing that what I was talking about earlier, lasting well into late fall, early winter. Another great American plant that's kind of undervalued, beach plum, uh, prunus meridima. 
Um, first of all, most people want to plant this because it gets thousands and thousands of blossoms. Really, really beautiful. I always say this is the kind of plant you could run a car over and probably not kill it. And I've seen, and I've seen it on Long Island, where, on beaches where people are literally parking their cars on top of these. And they grow back. They're just tough. They're very hard to kill. They grow in the worst possible place, which is beachfronts, sand, salt wind, abuse, and they come back and they shine. But if you give them full sun, and they must be in full sun, they can't be in part shade, and good drainage, we have heavy clay soil, but it's on a slope and drain, they'll, they'll produce thousands of flowers. I'd say the biggest hit against these is they're inconsistent. Some years you get thousands and thousands of small wild plums, and some years, like this year, you don't get a lot. You get three. Anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because three. they're being stripped. Actually, we didn't even get them. Yeah. So let's just be honest. Because they about will be that. eaten by yes. critters when they're young. Yeah. So um, the flavor to me is like wild plum and um, Concord grape kind of mixed. Small but wonderful, and they're variable. You're dealing with a wild plant, so sometimes you mm -hmm. eat one and go, oh, that's not really particularly, and sometimes you eat one and go, wow, that's incredible. Save that pit. Um, <laughs> large, large fruiting varieties tend to be sweeter, and there's a mythical stand in Maine that has yellow fruit that's supposed to be the best in the United States, and I've never seen that. This is closely related. There's about 12 wild American plums, and we actually, Perunus um, Americana, wild American plums, we found growing in Accord along a rail trail, and they were wonderful on her birthday last Aww. year, and they were wonderful. Nature's gift. Um, yeah. Um, other than that, they grow eight to 10 feet, Perfect, and these would be perfect in a suburb between houses as a privacy hedge because they're, they're kid pickable size. You know, the short, it's not going to get like this. Wait it's, a second, or someone or, or, who's yes, five yes, yes, yes. <laughs> they're they're good, um, and also because of the flowers, they're beautiful kind of pollinator supporters. And um, just to give you, a, I try always the last slide to have a hand reference so you get this, you know, the size of what the fruit is. These are not the plums that we're used to getting at our farmer's market, right? These are slightly larger than, let's say, what, a big cherry. Or, but worth it, delicious, makes the best jam. So I highly recommend. Uh, black currant, Ribes Americanum. So if you came for hers and his tour at our Arboretum, this would be on my tour, but not on his tour. Anyone with me on my tour liking black currant here? Thank you. I got one. I got two. Excellent. I actually really like this plant. It, this is um, one of the ones that for maybe eight years, ten years, I did nothing to. And it did reward us with some really beautiful flowers. If you know anything about Ribes in general, there I don't want to get too into it, so you should buy the book because the book goes into it. But there was a ban on having um, currants, black currants, as well as gooseberries and others because of the white pine industry at the turn of the century. That's all I'm going to say. Um, we have never seen a problem. Um, we have lots of white pine. Pines it's are taking over our it's property. It's not to say that that's not, it's not a real currants. problem, but we haven't seen that. Here. And if you're going to put in 300 currant bushes to start a currant wine industry, you should do blight resistant. And there are blight mm -hmm. resistant cultivars. Yep. Just to be conscious. So this is the fruit. It hangs in strigs. Generally speaking, this fruit ripens a little bit unevenly. So it's not like you can go out and just pick the strig and all the fruit will be ripe. However, again, there are strategies for picking it. Bagging it is a really wonderful way to let the fruit all ripen. I have three small shrubs that grew into one big one. I have plenty to share with birds and other wildlife, and I always have jam. I like to stand in front of the shrub and eat out of hand. This is a, this is a, a clove currant. This is, was found in the Midwest. It's, this particular one is Crandall's currant. Its flowers are larger and highly fragrant. So I have this in a pathway where I walk by. The fruits are larger. Uh, they have the, as Scott would say, the musky flavor as well. Um, but this is also a nice alternative for those who don't want to go, who want a little, oof, like a little nice fragrance in the spring because the straight species does not have 
any smell whatsoever. It's just beautiful that yellow smell, flowers. That we smell. That we smell. Po Pollinators <laughs> yes, smell, thank but you. We it's don't. true. It's true. Mm -hmm. And just kind of showing some more images of the flowers. Again, I talk about a lot of edible plants being highly ornamental. And I think that's a really important selling point to get people excited <coughs> about planting um, food trees and, and shrubs. Just a couple more images. A lot more images. Did I go the wrong way? Nope. Okay. Ah. Another okay. hers. So another this is hers. another one that if you were at, at Fortis, this would be on the Allison tour. This is chokeberry aronia. Um, most people are like, I didn't even know you could eat aronia. I thought it was just a wildlife plant that birds like. But quite frankly, if you get the right plant, it could be very tasty. And there are some ways to go about that, which are taste, taste, taste when you're in the wild, if you taste something that tastes good. They are now doing cultivars that are um, like Nero or Viking that were bred for their flavor content. I have found that if I freeze the fruit first, it's sweeter. If I freeze the fruit and then dehydrate, it's super sweet. It's crazy sweet. Mm -hmm. And these have such a high level of antioxidants because of their dark, dark color. They're just really highly nutritious. The one thing people don't realize is that in early spring, beautiful. it's yeah. as beautiful as a flowering pear tree. I won't say a flowering plum because that's <laughs> a little too much, but beautiful, low maintenance, lots of different sizes that this plant comes in depending on the cultivar. They have some that are low growing mounds. They have some that go to three feet, some that are eight feet. The one nice thing about this plant, it's so adaptable. You have a sunny site, great. You have a shade site, great. Clay, sandy, wet, dry. It does, it's, this is one where really you, you could drive a car yeah. over it. Yeah. It's really hardy that way. It's the, very we, adaptable. We saw this in Mount Batty in Maine in pockets on cliff's edges mm -hmm. growing on cliff sides. And then we saw this also off a rail trail right and by swamp, water's edge. Near a yeah, swamp, so. very adaptable. Also beautiful fluorescent deep red fall yeah, colors too, thank very you. handsome. I don't think I have a photo of and that, then, but their fall color is actually what the plant sellers and marketable uh, markets are pushing this plant as, not as a food plant, but as the fall color because it gets bright red, like a blueberry red. And this is, that's a creeping variety. That yes, just sorry, that's that was low, low, low grow. Low grow. Is a low grow? Yeah. Yep. And this is another wonderful cranberry vaccinium macrocarpum. Anything that holds water is, is a cranberry bog, which means if you go into a hardware store and buy a small bucket and put peat moss or pine needles, soil and sand in and stick a cranberry thing and bury that in the ground and cover the top so no one knows the dirty secret that you have it buried <laughs> in the ground, you have a cranberry bog and it'll creep out eight or 10 feet and slowly grow and spread through a garden. So that's actually, that's, there's a plastic container buried in the ground with a full-size cram, small cranberry bog with probably a dozen, 20 different plants. Um, I, other than that, these can be planted in average soil, but they need to be augmented when it's dry like it has been now. Other than that, pretty <coughs> pest-free, pretty disease-free, beautiful, subtle, but very beautiful flowers. Great, our cranberries ripen around. They're starting to get color now. now. Yeah. Um, wonderful, um, beautiful. And the, uh, the only pest that has ever hit these is yeah. one winter voles oh. got into mm -hmm. this patch and lived there for a, three months and ate, sheared the whole thing apart. They ended up growing back, but it was very depressing. They took a mature bog and kind of it's like a mower had gone through and cut them all. Yeah, that was very. Um, that was a very sad moment. I will say, a couple years ago, over at one of our like uh, big box stores, like a Lowe's, I think, was selling cranberry not as a food plant again, but more as a ground cover and had larger uh, foliage. So, as per our yep. book in the nineteen late nineteenth century, early twenties, there was a big industry in cranberries. There were like 20 states importing thousands of tons of cranberries. It was a big thing, and then that kind of phase passed. And now it's sort of a neglected thing, so there aren't very many cultivars. There's one called Pilgrim, which is extra productive, that produces more fruit, but um, 
that hasn't been quite discovered Wait, yet. can we just go back to this really, really quickly? Flowers. <laughs> Look yes, at the flowers. Beautiful. They're small. This is one of those plants where you really have to get up into its into it, <laughs> face to face, to really get it. Very I had never noticed them before, and um, I guess this was also considered craneberry yeah, was its cause original it name because like yeah. of the little flowers looking like a crane. So I just wanted to point that out. Something about sometimes going macro in your garden and really looking and, and noticing And things. again, needs yeah. acidic soil. Mm -hmm. Peat moss, if you don't want to use peat moss, because there's ethical reasons, sometimes people don't want to use yeah. peat, peat moss, go beneath a pine tree and get... Pined up. Don't yeah. dig the shovel directly into the pine. Go sideways and scrape a couple inches here and there off and make pine duff that's acidic, mixed with s sand, and um, and soil, and you'll get, or if you have already have acidic soil, um, but that's a, that's what all you need. Uh, elderberry, Sambucus canadensis, American elderberry, another wild plant. I'm sure you must have this all over the arboretum, yeah. right? Um, generally not thought of as a food plant, but a lot of foragers talk about this plant. A lot of nutritionists, herbalists, we love this plant. This takes advantage of um, disturbed areas, weedy areas, shade areas, sun areas. We have a large stand of it that we didn't put in. The uh, worst uh, growing yeah, conditions, worst slightly shade, boggy yeah. shade, horrible, will, will, which will kill any other fruit tree. And this is thriving in it. Thanks <laughs> to some birds. Yeah, I thanks guess. to some yeah. birds. Um, and when I say that, we have a bush that's 25 feet wide by 20 feet tall. It's just been suckering and suckering and it's this glorious giant and we don't have to do anything. We love this, well I love this because for many years I was using the flowers to make a wine, but you can also have a German friend who will go yes. cut the flowers for you and dip them in a batter. Make pancake batter and dip them and fry and, them. And then come with- And, and, and then cover them with, 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 with um, powdered sugar. And you get this floral quality of a fritter that was amazing. It was something that she grew up on. Because they taste like delicious. lemons. So they're extremely decadent and very good. That's a very northern But if you didn't want to go that way, you good. could easily make like a beverage, which is what we've done. You do have to be careful because of the glycosides that are in it that can make your stomach upset, which yeah. just means you just want the flower parts. You don't want any of the green stems. Yeah, or the berries. Or, or well, not, you're not the, jumping yeah. ahead. Yeah, yes. I didn't get to yeah. the berries, but yes. Um, and also it's a very big host plant for all different types of pollinators. Another wonderful reason to be growing this. We have, and I know we're talking just native, but I just want to say we have tried for many years and probably have killed at least a dozen European cultivars, which come out with this black le uh, negligee, black negligee and, or black yes, lace. And those and all die, they're, they're beautiful. But lately in the Midwest, there's been a big push by some of the universities to breed larger berries. We've been just growing Adams, Yorks, and uh, Adam and York, and then the one that a bird put out for us. But I have seen images of some of the berries that they're producing now, I, and they are beautiful. They're yeah, very large. Yeah, I would large. say within yeah. this, the, that within the places that sell food, the plants, like in the nurseries, you're going to see Bob Gordon and Wildwood. Those are the two you're going to see. Those are the University of Missouri introductions mm -hmm. because there's a cottage industry and elderberry wine there and they were asked by by wine growers to start production and those are double sized berries are very large and those are the ones that the midwest has developed and so that's like the hub of breeding improved elderberries and right some now. of them now are instead of hanging down they're hanging they're not hanging they're upright um so these are ripe now you would go well they were ripe couple months ago but in the picture the bird, the they're right now them, and yes. again this you could strategize by putting little bags on them if it was something you wanted to go um, and collect we used to make I haven't done it in a couple of years I used to make a syrup where I just do a little bit of a sweetener and a clove which is a preservative and you can mix it um, when you have a sore throat or you can mix it when you have a vodka I mean you could just do <laughs> these are very things. these it's are very really high great, yeah. Um, vitamin C and zinc, mm -hmm. so that's why all the the herbal remedy things have this as a flavor ingredient. So if you make this with sugar and cloves to preserve it, it becomes essentially a, a cough syrup that can be used, or a tea that can be made. Very hyper productive. And if you cook that with Sorry. sugar, 
the berries and strain it, it makes almost like a Welch's grape juice type drink. It's really, really good, and it's very healthy for you, too. Mm -hmm. Is that a cultivar, or is that... Uh, no, that's, that's a wild. The wild. That's the wild one. Yeah, it can be quite productive when they're When, when there's rain. When, when you have rain, yes. When there's yeah. rain. Yep. Yes, when there's rain. Uh, May apple, Podophyllum peltatum. I'm sure you have a big stand of this yes. here. Um, if you can get here when they have a stand of it and you're able to see the fruits, that is a real treat. Most people don't even realize that the fruit is edible with some caveats, which I'll get to in a moment. I definitely uh, love this. Uh, they call it a ground cover. It's a little tall, I guess, for a ground cover because sometimes it can get to be 14, 16 inches. But it is a ground cover plant. It opens up like an umbrella in early spring and you can kind of see the leaf starting to get fairly large, larger than my hand. Yeah, Let me see can, your they hand. Can, they can be yeah, about fairly large, a uh, lar mature, uh, mature stand. old stands. Woodland setting. Beautiful. Likes to yeah. be in shade. Most of the time, it's basically one big colony so that it's not uh, diverse, uh, genetically diverse. Doesn't matter, it will still produce fruit. These are the flowers, very small, underneath the leaf. Uh, most people would never see these unless you're on your hands and knees. Yes. I think I was on my stomach to take this photo, <laughs> to be honest with you. And there's the fruit maturing. Uh, if you have a single stem, it will, it's not mature enough, but when you have a double uh, V stem, that's when the fruit is, that's when the flower is mature enough to start to fruit. And this is the fruit during the summertime. And then if we had, I don't want to say normal because nothing's normal anymore, but if we had, let's say, a little bit more rain during our summer, um, we would have seen that the leaves starting to die back in late August. This time it was the beginning of August. And the fruits uh, have to be yellow in order to Squishy. be consumed. A lot of animals like this, a lot of wildlife, raccoons especially, but this is this year I managed to get one. So the trick about Mayapple, and it has a really fascinating history. Again, we wrote about it in the book. It tastes like tropical punch. I mean, yeah. it's delicious. It's like pear you, and passion fruit. You can't maybe. eat the skin. You can't eat the seeds. Okay, with that said, and it's a small fruit. It's a lot of it's work to get that flavor. <laughs> but it's a native Trop another, because we're going to talk about one more, a native tropical flavored fruit that's just delicious. And I know that a lot of people um, historically made jams out of it. Yeah. Or jelly. Yeah. Jellies, not jams. This is the other queen, another queen. Um, this one, out of everything here, this is the most difficult to grow in this area. This is from Georgia, Tennessee, in the south, where it's like a weed up into Ohio here. It's on the borderline of survival, which means if you get two plants and you want to get them from different people because if you have one, if you're getting, let's say, two plants from a, a grower, they're just taking the same genetic material. You want two different gene pools to cross-pollinate and then you're going to get small plants and then I'd say keep them as a house plant for a couple years and then plant them in early spring. The thicker the root system, the more hardy. Um, we have now got a giant colony of these and when they're happy, they riot. Uh, we put them in our greenhouse, so they say, oh, this is like Georgia and Tennessee, which means we're going to grow 45 feet under your greenhouse. We're going to take over your vegetable beds. We're going to grow under the, under the, under the, so these are a wonderful we're pain in the ass. Two, these are a yeah, pain in the two butt. Feet of, two feet yes, of gravel. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But we get about 150 passion fruit with that. Um, I think any garden would benefit from these flowers. They're absolutely beautiful, but they are aggressive. And that's an, uh, the Alba. It's Passiflora incarnata Alba. The Al so this is a very genetically different from the, the purple, which means good for pollination. Um, the, the growing industry is starting to pay attention to that, to make money, and you notice that because cultivars are starting to appear. There's one that's more, slightly more blue. One that's slightly so more pink. Blue. Yeah, so, purple, yeah. yeah, so that's good for genetic, for crossing, and you want to get two for the fruit. These are a traditional Native American uh, um, food, and also the leaves are used as a natural tranquilizer for people who have insomnia. They're very medicinal. All parts of the plant are used, but I, we like the fruit which when you step on it goes pop, hence the name 
maypop. <laughs> and Although I think in the south that you see the greenery come up, up in May. Yeah. In our gardens, I would call it more July pop. <laughs> so this in, is outside, not yeah, in the greenhouse. This house. is marginally zone five, but protection like a bucket over them or mulch over them. Once they have two or three years and they're in, they have been grown into a Minnesota. There's places that have this, but they have to be kind of protected. I mean, they're a thug of a plant. They just need to be kind of protected for a while, um, but absolutely beautiful. The flowers are spectacularly beautiful. Um, you need two vines, like I said, and, you, and because we're on the end of the range of survival, I would, only put these in full sun. I mean, 10, yeah. 10 hours, eight hours. If you want to actually get fruit to ripen, you want the maximum amount of sun if possible. And, and the best, Rolls Royce, best quality of possible soil. Not manure, but everything else. Com leaf forest, compost, broken down, a thick layer, well-drained soil in all day sun. Um, we have grown this outside of our greenhouse and we've gotten fruit off of it, but inside the greenhouse it's a riot. I mean, we literally get 150 passion fruit. They lack some of the flavor of tropical <coughs> passion fruit. They don't have the citrus. You can tell they're passion fruit. So when she makes salsa and I make passion fruit jelly, I squeeze oranges and lemons in mine to make up for that. But it's delightful. And it's, it's a great it plant. is a zone five plant. So it's one of those that you probably have to coddle if you're in this area for a couple of years if it's something you wanted. I would say before you do anything, you should come <coughs> visit us because it's almost a buyer beware. I, I'm not saying not to plant it, but you should also know what you're getting yeah, into it's gonna, beforehand. Yeah, yeah. I think it's worth it. Ours but, climbs 20 feet in the greenhouse and dies back to the ground, but thank out, God. But outside and of the greenhouse. Yeah, of the and it's now going it's, outside of the greenhouse. No, no, on the trellis, yeah. we have, it's maybe six feet now. Yeah, five, six, six, eight feet, feet. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah. And again, it's been a harder, drier year, so it's probably fighting to be productive this year. So it's not growing as floor for us outside the greenhouse. The third queen, Papa, Asamina triloba. <laughs> well, it is. Uh, okay. The most sugar of all American fruits, um, George Washington's favorite fruit. Um, sometimes the most irksome, just because it takes 10 years to get fruit, sometimes 12 years. I think with this, this is a taproot plant. The, the taproot tells the rest of the plant they're ready to produce fruit. So I've heard several people say, I've had a fruit for six years, I've had a tree for six years, it seems to be doing nothing. And what they don't see is the taproot. The taproot goes down and down, and with us, we're hitting bedrock after four feet, and then going at a right angle and going around <laughs> rocks, and it gets to a point where the roots are kind of about the length of the tree, and then it says, okay, ready, and next year you suddenly have fruit out of nowhere. And, and, and that's what it is, it's the taproot. And because of that, if you cut the taproot on these, you kill the plants. So you put them where you want, and, that's, and you leave it alone. Also, the other bugaboo that kind of gets people is when these are young, they like shade. When they're full grown, they want to be in all day sunlight. So, if you want to have to skip the pain in the butt that I have to, which is potting and repotting and repotting, put them in the ground where you want them, put a tomato cage over them with a shade cloth and keep them in a shade cloth. I think there's other fruit writers who say you can put grafted trees in immediately, but ours has struggled. I would say once they get about four feet, they're ready and you can take the shade cloth off on the ready, but a little tiny plant won't make it. But that being said, once they make it, they crank fruit out and they're very easy. Uh, we have very bad clay soil with very poor quality and ours produce fruit, gobs of fruit every year without any problem. No problems, not even raccoons and muskrats who are supposed to love it have stripped our trees. No problem, zero, zero pests, no spraying. And even in the drought, ours look a little beat up, but they're not bad. In years with too much rain and too much water, they seem, doesn't matter. They have definitely a kind of a wild plant quality. Uh, fruit is pollinated by flies and there's a myth that they have to be carrion flies because the fruit's supposed to look like decomposing <laughs> the meat. Flowers, look like the, the flowers, flowers excuse me, the, the flowers, excuse me, That not only look but also emit a fragrance yeah, that yeah. is um, It's skunky, flies, yeah. any fly. This looks like a common household fly and it's got pollen all over it. Um, because of sometimes flies are kind of somewhat lazy bums when it comes to pollination. They're not like butterflies and bees. I'll take a paintbrush and kind of 
go back and forth between trees. You need two trees for pollination, three better. Um, and there's the baby fruit starting. Uh, uh, Peterson, was it Michael Peterson, became obsessed with these about 10 or 15 years ago and bred gigantic size ones called Peterson pawpaws. Uh, as soon as those are grafted, they are sold out immediately. Yeah. They're very difficult to find. Uh, qu quite frankly, after you had 30 pawpaws, you're done. I, I've had enough. I don't need the biggest pawpaws. I don't. I have two grafted one. What's the difference between grafted varieties and wild? Grafted ones come into fruiting a little bit quicker, yeah. and they tend to be larger. Our big wild ones have small, medium, and large. Doesn't matter to me. Um, I like them. When they start to hit this point, they start to just get ripe, and they're slightly squishy, like that. That's ripe, and and to me, it's banana with a little bit of pine with a little bit of pineapple and coconut or banana and, mango, and coconut. Yeah, I get a little yeah, mango. Uh, yeah, um, wonderful. But there's a lot of connoisseurs who would say, "Oh no, don't listen to him. You want them to turn black and ferment because then they become like banana custard. And for people who like an absolutely strong banana custard flavor, you want it like that. But I like the more banana coconut flavor. It's milder. Other than that, um, 30 maybe feet, 40, slow growing, uh, and, and 10 years to get fruit. Um, I always say if you go into a nursery and you see a pawpaw this big, there's a $200 price tag, and you think, and people who don't know think, that's outrageous. There's a cherry tree here that's $35, and don't realize that that $200 tree has been kept for 10 or 12 years and repotted six or seven times. You can't just leave it, which means a guy made $100 or a woman after 10 years of watering that, repotting it six times and sold it to the nursery. And you can cut six years of waiting. So if you can find them grafted or this big, $200, $150, it's worth it. You want to just, but there's been a big yeah. renaissance on this yeah. fruit, and there's a lot of people talking and writing about this now, which is a fantastic this. thing. All that means, based also on what Scott just said, is there's not a lot of choices out there available. You might be able to get straight species, and for mm -hmm. us, we think that's just great, but if you're looking for a particular cultivar, now's the time to order for 2024. So. <laughs> I order I'm not, my fruit. I'm not kidding. I yeah. for order my fruit trees in winter. Stop, don't give hints. <laughs> Wait, yeah. I'm moving along. Wait, I don't, yeah. I don't. I forgot, I forgot to put my tag on this. This is um, spikenard, Aurelia rismosa. And if you look right it's out the window one. here, there's such a, a beautiful one. one there. If they're not looking, I'm gonna steal yes. berries from them. Um, <laughs> this is a great plant that's a herbaceous perennial, but is often mistaken as a woody shrub. And this loves shade. Oh, there's go. my, thank you, I'm a little backwards there. Um, which is fine, it's the last one, so I'm allowed to be. So here you can see um, the flowers are starting to form. We have this in deep shade. We had tried lots of different aspects, like part shade. Some people would say like um, part sun, part shade, yeah. but really it needs to be in a, sh well for us shade, maybe for you guys over here, you're going to tell me it's a full sun site, aren't you? No, it's the north side of the village. Yeah, okay. if it's not okay, in I complete it <laughs> shade, it needs consistent watering. Right. This is one of my favorite wild berries, yeah. and I have moved it three or four times to try to get the right thing, and I've now put it in full shade, and now we had a drought, and I'm still not getting it. So here, here are the flowers. Um, been pollinated and the berries start to form it's really it's, truthfully this is a background plant you you know it's not gonna be like look at me look at me however it's really a worthy one for those of you who have a lot of woods and shade and are looking for something because over time this can get to be four feet by four feet maybe even six feet by six feet which is really nice and here the fruit is forming and those are the berries. And Scott makes a delicious drink. You can eat them out of hand. They're small, so you'd have to eat a lot. But we make a delicious Yeah, one they taste like a cross. This is sarsaparilla. This is one of the things sarsaparilla oh. used to be made. They taste like a cross between licorice and blackberry. Oh. And if you cook those and strain them, they make a kind of a, a spicy licorice blackberry drink. Wonderful. I, I, this is one of my favorite wild Not berries. spicy like hot spicy, but, but tangy. Complex, zesty, complex. Yeah. 
Bernie, slightly burnt, wonderful. And again, it's beautiful. So if it's and not something you're into. Wildlife, birds, love this berry. And like all over Asia, the sh Japanese people call this udo. They harvest the shoots in spring because they have some of that tangy licorice quality. So Native American tribes cut the shoots from this and cook them and, and, and use Stews them for stir frying. And, yep. So there's a multi thing. I want the berries, so I don't want to cut the plant. I, I, it's the berries that I want. And the, and the roots were used to make root beer. That's a traditional root beer mm -hmm. ingredient. Mm -hmm. And so that's 12 uh, native edible fruiting nut plants. There's I guess 12, 38 more in our book, but not some more native ones. Um, this is just showing you a little map. It's a little information about us. If you, It's a beautiful one hour drive south. Um, and we, like I said, we're not open year round. Um, we're only open now through um, Halloween. Saturdays and Sundays. Saturdays and Sundays. And um, we're gonna hang out. We'll talk more any to questions? anyone who, yes. Yeah. Oh, question time. Questions. Yes. <laughs> You questions? Have, you have questions. We'll do a little bit of Q&A. Anybody with questions? Can, can you take, can he take his mask There's just to... Two pawpaw trees I bought, and they seem like they've been getting uh, sunburned. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have one of the worst growing year, the drought. It's probably the drought, but you're, you kind of... In, the size, they weren't like this. You said no, they're this. Yeah, that's that's why. I, I've been able, you know, keep watering them. If they seem burned up over and over, I would just put a, a shade canopy for another couple of years and let them get a little bit bigger. I had grafted ones that I was told by another famous fruit writer that you could put in, and those, I watered them constantly. They were within an inch of their life of dying. And then once they got a couple about this big, it was like, okay, it's fine. So, and again, I think it's the taproot. Taproot goes down and hits a thing where it's always just slightly moist and then it's not getting burned anymore. It's so just, like now you don't need your tomato cages anymore, right? You can <laughs> put that on for the next couple of weeks, right? With a little piece of ag cloth and you're good. You're welcome. Yep. Can you tell me about the American highbush cranberry, the fruit? Ah, you mean the viburnum? Yes. yes. That's yes. a viburnum. So we actually call that stinky toe fruit. Um, I plant, I have, we love viburnums. We have a large stand of it. And um, I didn't realize that those berries could get so stinky that not even the birds in late winter take them off. Now, some people love them, and so this could be one of those things where certain specimens, just like people, are slightly different and maybe that there's something out there that I'm missing. I'm all, I would love to be able to eat it. I mean, do you the, have a, wait, have you had it? I have a boundary filled with them, two sides. And? And I tried to make some with them last year. And what did you think? <laughs> My brother tried to make wine. I made mustard and a hot pepper relish. It kind of passed there. Okay. Very yeah, Very I, I, I call those five minute epoxy berries. They give off the smell that epoxy does to me when they're cooked. I have a vote of the, I have the vote of the two worst things I've ever had in our garden. That's one of them, and the other is um, a mountain ash from the improved varieties, which tastes like fermented, Stop. fermented vinegar to me. Huh? You can, certain, certain, yeah. yes, yes, yeah, yeah. But taste is complex. There's a right. lot of people who make cranberry right. relish out of that. I love banana custard. He does not. So like when he's talking about pawpaw, right, he, he only likes it at one level. I like it at all the levels. Yeah. So. Uh, the question, honeyberries. Yeah. Honeyberries so are great. Like two varieties. Mm -hmm. I got fruit like the first year, nothing since. Uh, how big are they? They're like six feet tall. I'm surprised you're not getting... Um, um, <clears throat> Uh, when you said you planted, you got them the first year, that means were they already flowering at the nursery and then you brought them? No, they were probably about two feet And they hadn't off. flowered yet at the nursery. Sometimes when sitting in nursery rows, they get pollinated and you bring things home and you don't realize they've already been pollinated. Usually with two, you get crops. Honeyberries are technically from the United States, Canada, Siberia, open tundra, prairies, um, 
Uh, they're like blueberries, shaped like tubes. There's an early flowering varieties, and then there's a late flowering. That would be the one thing maybe they didn't sell the you late, a set. Yeah, late tend to be from Japan, and they do fruit later. And it's only recently that um, nurseries are correctly, correctly identifying, identifying the earlies with earlies. They all flower the same time. Yeah. So one of the things we hear a lot from people is I bought something the first year it flowered I got fruit it was delicious and I haven't had anything since and it could just be a time issue where if you did get the correct set which we're cross fingers that you did that maybe next year or the following year but they when, do but when you say you're this early. big that's big and mature I'm wondering yeah. when people oh, yeah. start they're, they're yeah. like they're now like probably seven years old yeah, oh, yeah. I, 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 I think it's I trim them like a hedge because they I, I think it may be that set. you were sold a mixed set. If you know what the cultivar names are, um, those are the earliest fruit for those of you who don't know, because those are from like Siberia and the, the Canadian tundra and the prairies. So, they, the, I mean, I, ours, ours have flowered when it dropped to 17 degrees at night, and the flowers are like, who cares? We're from Siberia. We're from the worst part of the world. It doesn't matter. It, we've taken, you know, I literally see little flowers at 17 degrees did not bother because they're from the so Canadian like prairie. No, not No, at all. I don't think no. so. They're really tough. I, they I, don't yeah. like full, where ours are in full sun and they're getting burned up because we're on the actually the warmer part of their growing range. They, they, they would like the open yeah. tundra like zone three mm -hmm. so they would actually probably like a little bit more shade we're in, in like sun. 12 hours but of you sun, know what an easy fix could be to get get in one more get one one more because one of the others is definitely yeah. it's going to happen and yeah. i would say go if you're looking for native go for the early set yeah because that produces the fruit the earliest it's mm -hmm. even before strawberry so it's great People say that's as good as a blueberry. Is it as good as a blueberry? No. Not really, but it's you know, but it's good. It is good because it gives its well, food. Well, wait, I will say, when you do get your fruit, because I know you will, <laughs> when you get fruit from older specimens, the fruit actually does better. start yeah. to sweeten. There's something I, I'm mm. not, I, my background's not in biology, so I don't know, but there is something about that. It seems to improve. That. They get, they get better I'm, as I they was get like, older. wow, maybe people are right about what they're saying, this being so tasty, because the first couple of years, it was very sour, and, mm. and I wouldn't say astringent, but sour, so... Mm. But it's it's a beautiful plant, easy maintain, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so, it just you just need one more. <laughs> uh, your location? Are you high elevation like here, or are you more down? The we are on a small mountain. We're nine hundred feet, so. Nine hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're like thirty feet. Where we were. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so we're 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 higher than you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're definitely coming to see. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Your chestnut trees, do they have a, are they totally blight resistant? Or yeah, they, uh, they, they're they not blight proof, but they're blight resistant. We've been growing, I, it's my understanding, when the trees get mature enough to have cracks through them, that's when the blight attacks them. Uh -huh. um, so some people actually coat their trees with mud to stop that period so that the blight can't get into them or, or paint them with a light kind of latex paint. Um, but yeah, ours, have, we have a tree that the trunk's this large and it's kind of going on 30 feet now. And we had a pollinator and we have a, a sassafras tree that's the largest one I've ever seen. So we haven't cut it down and it cracked in half and killed one of our trees, oh. smashed it right down to the ground. So we ended up buying another chestnut but yeah, we had four or five years of nuts and it's grown fast. It's only been there 12 years and it's getting to be 30 feet in the trunk and it's completely covered with the chestnuts. And if you come, you could see we had a storm hit it when it was like two years old. So I went out, I was crying. I was like, oh my God, we just put these in. Go get this, go get your drill. And I we drilled through together. and we <laughs> waxed over it and you can't even see it now. So we went very old school that way. Put stainless um, steel screws right. through it, hold it back together. But I will say the Dunstan, the couple of little points about Dunstan, which I find fascinating because we did a ton of research and I went to the American Chestnut Society, which they don't talk about Dunstan at all. They have a lot of other cultivars that they push. Dunstan's the only one that's trademarked. So for whatever that's worth, I know that I've, about reading about him and what they're trying to do. Their whole push is to get American chestnuts with a little bit of Chinese genes out to more and more people who are not necessarily 
plant fanatics, but just want to grow a nice Native American tree. So they are starting to send um, plants to places like Walmart all over the country yeah. and make this plant more affordable to get them in the backyards of people's homes. There is now a big thing happening through a lot of the universities where um, they have now put a wheat gene into the American chestnut. Um, it's a whole big complicated thing. A lot of people have a problem with the whole Genetic idea. splicing. But, you know, when you're doing back crossing, you're also changing the genetic makeup of something. So I think we have to be careful and thoughtful about how we view things um, we in had, general. So. We had a, nut, a famous nut grower from the West Coast said that he doesn't think Dunstans are Chi American. They're completely pure Chinese. That's what he mm -hmm. said. Because a DNA analysis was done on, on a, an Oregon tree and said, and, and we had a student from Cornell from their agriculture ESF. E ESF come and look at them and to, to do a survey and then balls, yeah. yes and he and his professor does DNA analysis of chestnuts so it's way above my pay grade <laughs> and they emailed us and said no he he doesn't think just they're they're straight they thinks that it's a blend American chestnuts have pointed buds Asian have round and ours is in between and between our trees they're slightly different. They're not exactly the same. You can tell the gene pool's fluid. We have three, and they're all slightly different. But they're not, there isn't a straight point or an exact oval. It's kind of cone-shaped. We had one that came from the uh, chestnut lab at the ESL. Mm -hmm. And it was about that big when we planted it. It got to be about nine years old, and it was about nine feet tall. And our understanding was that about the age of 15 years, light would kick in. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. But yeah. Before it got to that point, the beaver took it. Down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the the chestnut society was trying to breed and select for best chestnuts, and they did a major thing where they planted out like 500, and they came back to survey three years, and deer had eaten like three quarters of the thing. There was like 75 left, and so a lot of it's what you don't. It's not. It's not just gene pool. It's everything else. If it's a dry year and, and the deer have nothing else to eat, and they're given a mountainside of chestnuts, they will take advantage of it by eating them all. So, uh, you know, their stuff is kind of mixed successful. There's a lot of people trying to keep this alive as a great tree because it's a wonderful American tree. Any other questions? All right, well, you've been yeah, really, thank you, thank you so much thank you for the audience.